Well, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to welcome you to tonight's celebration. I'm Jean Andre, the Dean of the Faculty of Environment, and, um, and I will be your host for today. I'd like to extend a special welcome to this evening's honorees, as well as their nominators, their supporters, family, friends, and of course, all of the students, alumni, retirees, staff, and faculty who are in attendance here with us. I'd like to begin by publicly acknowledging the land that the University of Waterloo is situated on. The Waterloo, Kitchener, and Cambridge campuses of our university are on the Haldeman Tract, land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River, land within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our ability to work and live here now in Waterloo Region is tied to policies of expulsion, assimilation, and abuse of Indigenous peoples during the time of settlement and confederation and since. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and understand this history, these truths, and to have these inform our, our work with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'm a fifth generation Canadian, and my ancestors were farmers from Southwest Germany who benefited from land grants along the Allure Road in the mid 19th century as they opened up the county of Bruce. My grandparents and parents met some of the displaced Indigenous people and often talked about how their gain, and in turn mine and that of my children and grandchildren, was at the expense of the Indigenous peoples whose land we're on. We're hosting the event today as a university committed to working collaboratively on and off campus to advance the, the goals of the truth and reconciliation calls to action and to create a long-term vision for the university that is grounded in decolonization. And I invite you all, of course, in your own lives to embark on that same journey. Well, tonight we have the pleasure of recognizing five award honorees in three award categories. One is a brilliant disaster management researcher with a passion for disseminating knowledge. Another, an accomplished business person and true champion of Waterloo, who has stepped up as the faculty's first class champion. The third, an incredible leader in industry with an unwavering commitment to innovation, integrity, and strategic thinking, who has a 50 year history of supporting our students. Also a world-class academic and trailblazer whose pioneering work in gender and social sustainability has transformed academia. And a pioneer in ecological planning whose professional and philanthropic contributions have protected thousands of hectares of environmentally sensitive areas. Let me tell you a little about our alumni award program. The program was introduced in 2008 with our Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award, which was created to honor and recognize the accomplishments of some of our most successful and established alumni. Business leaders, academic heavy hitters, fearless public servants and civil leaders, graduates who've distinguished themselves through their professional or academic achievements, through their community service or their impacts on sustainability. Then in 2013, we added the Young Alumni Inspiration Award to recognize grads of the most recent decade who are already making a difference in their communities. These passionate leaders shine on as an example and inspiration to our current students and also our young alum. Then our third award was established in 2019. The Friend of the Faculty Impact Award was created to recognize our partners and allies who support the faculty through volunteerism, service, and philanthropy. They advance the mission of the faculty and the university, and in so doing, they contribute to the success of our students, our programs, our research, and they heighten our impact. Well, over the years, we've had the privilege to recognize 30 honorees, individuals and organizations whose accomplishments and dedication have made a difference in so many ways. Just three examples a Nobel Prize winning researcher on the impacts of climate change and water resources in wetlands, and that's Linda, Linda Morch through her work with the IPCC. Um, Wanjiko Chiri, who mobilized community participation in sustainable rural development projects in Africa. 
And a third example, Aaron Stewart, who has been building capacity for clean energy initiatives in indigenous communities throughout Canada. Well, this evening I have the pleasure of welcoming five new award recipients into this prestigious fellowship. But before we get started, I would like to encourage everyone to remember to share congratulations in the chat as people are introduced and we have a chance to get to know them a little through exchanges. I hope you'll share your good wishes in the chat. Near the end of the program, we'll have a chance to have some of your questions addressed. And in that case, I'll ask you to put your questions in the Q&A. So happy messages in the chat and questions in the Q&A. Okay, here we go. Our first award this evening recognizes one of the first graduates of Environment's Unique Knowledge Integration Program, a program that everybody wants to know more about. Even as an undergraduate student, we knew this recipient, Dr. Eric Kennedy, had a very bright future. For example, he took fourth year seminars in his second year. He served as a teaching assistant in the Peace and Conflict Studies program and as a research assistant with a faculty member. And he also provided leadership within the KI program through the Student Association. After graduating, Eric went on to complete a master's and PhD in human and social dimensions of science and technology at Arizona State University, where he conducted research on fisheries and wildlife management wildfire management, citizen science, and climate change. He produced an impressive publication record, and he's earned several fellowships there and several awards as well, including the Equinox Fellowship with the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, for which he was selected as a top 30 leader on global education. While completing his PhD, Eric was offered a tenure track position at York, where he's currently assistant professor in the Disaster and Emergency Management Program and director of a research group dedicated to improving how we prepare for, respond to, and manage emergencies. Eric's research focuses on the intersection of emergency management and environmental issues, particularly as it relates to wildfires. Recently, much of his work has turned to the pandemic. He's led several initiatives tracking the social impacts of the coronavirus outbreak and advising governments he supported the Public Health Agency of Canada and other governments as well in emergency managers. He's provided critical data about how communities are affected, and he leads an international working group coordinating the rapidly growing community of researchers contributing to this body of knowledge. Remarkably, Eric has continued to excel in scholarly roles while investing in society at large. He's founded the Forum on Science, Policy and Society, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to training the next generation of Canadian policy leaders in science, environmental and health policy. Through this organization, Eric runs a program called Science Outside the Lab, which fills a critical gap in, in linking exceptional graduate students, young professionals um, with public service um, uh, policy and, and, and individuals. So you can tell already, Eric, is off to an amazing start in his career. It sounds really like an entire lifetime of achievements already. It's, it's, it's gonna be amazing to watch what, what you're up to. So please share your messages of congratulations in the chat. We'll get to know Eric a little bit now with the video. I've always been someone who enjoys being outdoors, enjoys camping and canoeing and hiking and exploring. Um, but I've also been really intrigued all throughout my life by environmental problems, right? How we protect the environment, how we address climate change, how we manage our natural resources um, in, in a better, more accountable way. There also, though, was uh, the side on, on emergency management, too. Um, so one of my first formative memories was my parents taking me to watch fire trucks at some fires around Waterloo, in particular at Seagram's when it burned down. But there were other kinds of, of involvement as well. So at Waterloo, I was um, the coordinator of the campus response team and involved in the campus response team all four years of my degree. Um, and that firsthand uh, medical and emergency response 
um, experience was was really formative. What I realized was that I could bring together these environmental interests and these emergency response interests and combine them into looking at things like wildfire and forest fire um, as a really cool way to explore both sides of, of the issue and to integrate my passions uh, on these diverse topics. As a professor of emergency management, um, there are a number of different roles that I have. So I teach the next generation of emergency managers. We have both undergraduate and graduate programs in disaster and emergency management. I also do lots of research related to disasters and emergencies. So I study how people make decisions in crises. I really care about community engagement, about working with decision makers and about um, trying to make the world a little bit better for others. And so um, to me, success looks like having this positive impact with our work. If I could go back to the beginning of university, I think I would encourage myself to push myself a little bit more in the courses that uh, challenged me and that I was nervous about. Um, because they may have been tough experiences at the time, but I think they were a lot of what became useful down the road and, and shaped me into who I am today. I think all of this advice comes back to the notion of embracing a really diverse set of experiences, of trying things out, of not being afraid to try something new and decide you don't like it and try something else new. Um, and I think that pattern of advice to embracing diverse experiences and to trying to make connections between them and being open to these intersections is what ultimately led me to the career that I really enjoy now and, and the opportunities that I have to give back that um, I feel really fortunate about. Thank you so much to the Faculty of Environment for this distinct honor. As a recipient, there are many folks I'd like to thank, my parents, my partner, and the many staff and advisors and professors at Waterloo who really profoundly shaped my journey. And as a professor of disaster and emergency management in this era of catastrophes, I'd love nothing more than to spend uh, several minutes or longer talking about how we can build a safer, more equitable, and more compassionate society. But what I really want to do tonight is to celebrate someone else from our environment community, someone who profoundly shaped me for the better and transformed our faculty and our university. Last week, we lost Linda Carson, an incredible professor, teacher, and program designer uh, after a battle with ALS. Not only was she a dear friend and mentor to us in environment, but she was the driving force behind the knowledge integration program and an interdisciplinarian extraordinaire. She had degrees from three faculties across campus. When remembering incredible community members, it's a bit of a truism or a cliche to talk about how their legacy lives on. But I think Linda really exemplifies that. She taught not just environment students, but students from all across campus, so many lessons about how to be creative, how to generate trustworthy knowledge, and how to collaborate effectively. We students often talk about Lindaisms, like her advice about cre thinking creatively. She always encouraged us to, uh, in the pursuit of catching big fish ideas, to catch a lot of fish and throw the little ones back. She implored us to remember that there are fewer rules than you think and to separate out the divergent and convergent phases of critical thinking. She taught us to reject dichotomies about the importance of metacognition and being self-aware and to be public in your praise for others. Given her incredible influence on all of us for the better here in environment and across the university, I'd like to dedicate this award to her, to her incredible legacy of inspiration and mentorship and to all of the teachers across the Faculty of Environment that care about and invest in their students like Linda did. So thank you. That was, um, that was so, so beautiful. Thank you for recognizing Linda. Of course, we, we've all been grieving her loss and as we became aware of it this week and uh, that's amazing that, that you would uh, dedicate your award to her in this way, so, so thank you. Maybe we have a few minutes, maybe we could just, um, I could ask a, a few questions just so people can get to know you a little better. I wonder if sure. you could just tell us a little bit more about that science outside the lab um, initiative. Tell us, you know, what kind of people you're working with and, and really what makes that um, really something special. Like, what are you trying to achieve? 
Yeah, so this is an experiential education program uh, that I co-founded to bring promising graduate students from across Canada and around the world to Ottawa and Montreal and Vancouver and Victoria and the places where decision making happens in Canada. Um, and my selfish goal in this was to create an experience like this to have an opportunity to build networks and make connections, but it's also about creating the next generation of talent for science policy leadership. Some of these students will go on to stay in academia, but now have a richer sense of what their work can do and how it can influence decision making. For others, this is about finding the path, right? You, you're in a master's degree or a PhD and you're not sure you want to stick around this weird thing we call the university, right? We can, we can share opportunities and pathways that exist in journalism and think tanks and the public service where you can use the skills that you pick up in graduate school and apply them to making the world a better place. So it's all about trying to foster those connections for the next generation of science policy leadership. Okay, thank you. Maybe a bigger question. It's a bit harder. Like, like a lot of people are talking about resilience, and you can think about it in the personal sense. I know that you often think about it in the societal sense. Like, do you have are, are there things you can tell us that make us hopeful that we're getting more resilient in in some ways? Um, just a you know a few thoughts about the idea of societal resilience, which I know is something you think about all the time. Absolutely. Look, I, I gave a talk actually at Conrad Grable last week, and I talked about the improbable places that we can find hope. We live in this era of catastrophe, of cataclysmic fires followed by floods, all wealth uh, contagion is raging on. Um, and to me, the illustration of hope is found in a strip mall in Winnipeg between a Leon's furniture warehouse and a Hakeem optical. There's this little office with six people called the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Center. And it is the glue that holds together our forest fire response across the country. They are the bureaucrats and the administrators that figure out how we can send firefighters from Ontario and Quebec out to British Columbia when they need help and how we'll make this kind of collaboration sustainable and uh, just and equitable over time. And I think if there's hope to be found amidst all this calamity, it's in community and collaboration. Uh, and the sort of Waterloo barn raising spirit is present in that strip mall as we figure out how to work together to fight these giant fires and to handle them in a more ecologically responsible way. And I think that's the only path forward as we face these kind of disasters is to figure out how to work together and how to build strong institutions. Yeah, th thank you for that. And, you know, thank you, especially for mentioning the barn raising, as, as, as you know, our former president and governor general used to uh, used to talk about the barn raising mentality of Waterloo Region. So it's nice to have you reference that, uh, that as well. Um, I know we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit more with you at the end when we all gather together. And so I just want to say again, congratulations, Eric, and uh, thanks for, sh for sharing some of your thoughts. Thanks so much. Okay. Next, we transition to the Friend of the Faculty Impact Award. And our first awardee in this category is Anne-Marie Murray. Now, very few people give of their time and their talent so freely with such conviction and compassion as Anne-Marie. And you only have to meet her once to, to know that she's got that kind of energy and drive to make a difference. So the value of volunteerism was instilled in Anne-Marie from an early age. And over the years, she's volunteered with many worthy organizations, including the Girl Guides of Canada, so did I, Anne-Marie, just saying, um, the Toronto Pan and Parapan American Games, Ovarian Cancer Canada, and Futurepreneur Canada, all while launching, leading an independent digital marketing firm, which Anne-Marie still runs. The university, however, held a central place in her heart and Anne-Marie graduated from the School of Planning in 1995 um, with a network of amazing friendships and, um, and um, sort of memories. And, and that time that she spent with, I know she talks about it as being formative and inspiring personal growth. And um, this has nourished her throughout her life. And since graduation, Anne-Marie has been such an amazing champion for the university and for the faculty. She stays in touch with her classmates and she's brought them together for re reunions, but she's even encouraged her friends' children to attend the University of Waterloo, which is, uh, which is a testament to uh, how much she believes in us, which is very humbling. Anne-Marie signed on as the Faculty of Environment's first official class champion. She mentors students through the E&D Connect, 
the faculty's online network, networking net hub, which some of you are aware of. And she's been a keynote speaker at several of Waterloo events. In 2019, she launched the Faculty of Environment's first class fund, through which she and her classmates raised more than $20,000 to establish the planning class of 1995 entrance scholarship. And since then, a number of other classes and class champions have followed in her footsteps, establishing scholarships in their classes' names. Now, the same year, the University of Waterloo established an alumni chapter in Toronto, which is home to the university's largest alumni base. Again, Anne-Marie put up her hand to become the inaugural co-lead of the Toronto alumni chapter. And for two years, she worked tirelessly to lead a group of alumni volunteers. Now she stayed on since then as a leadership advisor to help the chapter continue to grow. Well, 30 years ago, Anne-Marie was a fresh faced student beginning a new phase of her life that would shape the person she was to become. And today she's a leader within our same institution, inspiring and supporting the next generation. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to recognize Anne-Marie with the award uh, today. So please share your congratulations in the chat and we'll get to know Anne-Marie a little bit with a video and then we'll get to hear from her live as well. My parents, they instilled in us the importance to help others, but also the, my mother was extremely uh, involved in volunteering, um, right from, you know, being a classroom helper to being a girl guide leader. And so, you know, it's like I took, I took lead from her to be able to, you know, sort of start volunteering myself. I love meeting new people and spending time with people and, and really helping them. I volunteer at the Toronto airport um, to help people you know, with wayfinding. And it's just, it's so exciting giving somebody a really good first impression or last impression of being in Toronto. So my time at Waterloo can be characterized by it just being the four best years of my entire life. I've never had four years in a row that have been as great as the four years I spent at Waterloo. What really sort of stood out for me in those four years is that exchange to Oxford Brooks University um, was really special for me. I, different from my classmates, I decided to stay for the entire summer. It was a challenge to live and work in a different country, to you know have that day to day, and also just to open myself up to new experiences. Three words to describe Anne Marie the student would be uh, hardworking, funny, and tall. I tell my pre-university self to be open to all the new experiences that are going to be you know put on my doorstep, but also the importance of all the people that I'm just about to meet on this journey and that they'll be with you for the next 30 plus years. My friends and colleagues would describe me now as probably glue, the glue that holds everybody together. Um, also, they would describe me as hardworking still um, and uh, just loving. Still tall. Yes. <laughs> my experience was so great from the four years from the education i received from the people i met from the instructors i had i want somebody else to have that experience i hope that people have this have at least one if not as many connections and friendships and memories of the faculty the program and the university as i do I just want to thank um, thank the university and the faculty so much for this awesome award, the friend of the friend of the faculty award. Uh, I want to thank my good friends Leanne O'Mara and Joe Calavong who nominated me for the award. Um, your friendship definitely contributed to how great my time was in the faculty, and now over thirty years later, um, we're still enjoying that friendship and so many memories from our UW uh, and beyond. Um, thank you to the team of the faculty. Uh, Dina, Miriam, Dean Jean, uh, working with you over the years as a class champion and more has um, and, and more has been uh, much better because of all of you. Uh, my time at Waterloo, specifically in the faculty, helped shape who I am. Um, and I know that the skills that I gained at UW from inside the lecture halls to hours in the computer lab and 
again, hours in the coffee shop, um, definitely, you know, have made me who I am today. Um, with the scholarship that we created, I hope that the recipients each year can have the wonderful experiences that, that I did and will continue to support the program, the faculty, the university after they graduate, um, because it's just, it's so important to give back. Uh, I wanna thank you again for the award and I'm really looking forward to um, what else I can do with the university and the wonderful team at the university uh, in the coming years, days, hours, months, whatever we can do together. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, Anne-Marie. Okay, I have to ask you, you described yourself and then you used tall. Maybe you should tell, I'd like you to tell everyone what the name of your company is, because I think that's totally cool. <laughs> My company name is Long Legs Media. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's great. I think nobody forgets that one when, once you've introduced them once. But you know, my, my serious question is about about this this your secret to be able to balance all these things. Like like, you know, I can barely keep up with work. I feel and 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 sometimes I worry that you know even friendships almost seem like a luxury. You know, how do you manage to juggle everything and still find time to give not just a token amount of volunteerism but actual leadership in these things? Like, how do you do it? What's your secret? Um, I think for me, it's really about prioritizing what's important. Um, and yes, work pays the bills and, you know, gives you some satisfaction and stuff, but it's the, it's the volunteering, it's the giving back, it's making somebody's day happier or, you know, making it better. Um, and then also like the, you know, my most important thing in my life is my friendships and my network. And without those I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be the person I am today. And again, most of those, most of those true close friendships started, you know, probably in the computer lab at the faculty in uh, environment too. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny you talk about the computer labs, different alumni have said that, you know, they would stay in the computer lab until, until it smelled. And then they would all go home for, for a shower. So I'm not going to ask you whether you stayed stayed that long, but uh, but I do know what you mean. Of course, today people are working digitally, so their experiences might have to be a slightly different sort of set. But uh, but yeah, thanks for sh sharing that memory with us. Um, okay, so you know what? We're going to connect with you again a little bit at the end as as um, as we bring everybody back. But uh, you know, a warm a warm congratulations, but really a heartfelt thank you for everything you do for us. It's amazing. Thank you. Okay, now I would like to introduce you to our second friend of the Faculty Impact Award recipient. It's a rare friendship that lasts nearly 50 years and I'm so pleased that MHBC Planning, Urban Design and Landscape Architecture is being recognized for their tremendous support that they've provided the university and the faculty and the School of Planning over all this time. With us tonight is Brian Zaman, president of MHBC and alum of the faculty. And um, so let me tell you a little about the firm. So the firm itself was, was founded in 1973 by alumnus Ian McNaughton, who was part of the first class of the undergraduate planners in this country. And uh, also he's a recipient of the Alumni Achievement Award with us in 2013. Now today the company has grown to be one of the largest and most respected planning firms in Ontario with six offices and a team of more than 100. Over the years, MHBC has employed literally hundreds of co-op students, giving them the valuable opportunity to apply what they've learned in the classroom to real world settings. And they've also hired countless alumni. In fact, 70% of the partners at MHBC are Waterloo grads. MHBC staff have kept the connection to Waterloo strong by sitting on committees, by providing guest lectures that bring the application of industry knowledge to the classroom, by sponsoring students to attend the legendary University of Waterloo Planning Alumni of Toronto UPAT Gala Dinner, which uh, some of us have had the pleasure of also going to, and by mentoring students at leadership events and through ENV Connect. MHBC staff have served as planners in residence, and as Pragma Council members, providing students with networking and insights into how things really work. This past year, MHBC created the flagship award for Black and Indigenous students to help make planning education more accessible and the planning profession more equitable and diverse. Led by Eldon Theodore and supported unanimously across the company, 
the initiative has already impacted the life of one of our bright, brightest students in the School of Planning. It is, of course, difficult to do justice to the impact of the MHBC's support. Their involvement at Waterloo, as I said, has spanned five decades and continues to branch out. But for, so for all of their many contributions, we are just delighted to recognize this amazing firm this evening with our Faculty Impact Award. So congratulations. Well, again, I ask you to put your congratulations in the chat and we'll have a chance to see a video and to meet Brian. University of Waterloo is uh, the pipeline, provides the, uh, the blood and the veins of MHBC. I wasn't a particularly good student in the sciences and the maths, geography I just loved. Uh, Waterloo had a good program and um, they welcomed me on the football team, so it was a natural. My time at the University of Waterloo were some of my fondest uh, memories. Uh, the four years at the University is where I forged my greatest memories and my greatest friendships uh, that continue to exist today. When the company was started, I was fortunate to be the first graduate in this field in undergraduate planning in the country. MHBC provides uh, planning, urban design, uh, cultural heritage, landscape architect services to both the private and public sector. What that really means is we help design the communities that we live in and ultimately help to protect and utilize the resources that we need to build and feed our communities in a responsible and sustainable way. I think the success that uh, I've enjoyed, MHBC has enjoyed, is we combined both fundamentals of business with professionalism. Put those two things together and we had success. The MHBC Award for Black and Indigenous Students uh, started as a result of the social movement in 2020. It started a discussion within our, our company itself. And uh, I, you know, coming up from a white background, uh, growing up in Oakville, uh, it opened me up to discussions and dialogue with other colleagues, other people uh, that did come up from different uh, upbringings, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. And it really taught me a lot of the different perspectives and different challenges. The success of MHBC, I have a lot to owe to Ian McNaughton, the founder of the company. It's the guiding principles that he established back in 1973 that continue to guide uh, the way we continue to run our company today. We've always challenged each other. Uh, from day one, he, he allowed me to challenge his thought process. I learned as a young planner that I was, uh, he allowed that challenge, but I learned very early in my career. I was seldom right at the beginning and he had taught me a lot, but allowed me to have that perspective and have that, that, that dialogue and debate. And ultimately, I think we've learned from each other over the years. We and, sure have. And we were certainly able to better serve our clients as a team when we work together closely. I owe Waterloo a tremendous amount. Gave me a career and ultimately gave me a business. Thank you. Best piece of advice was from my wife. She said, I want you to go out and start your own company. I've got faith in you. You can do it take the risk and do it now. But it turned out her advice was the best advice I've ever received. To describe Ian, I would describe Ian as brilliant, determined. Let me just, give me a second. I'm just gonna, I wanna think this through properly. I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> the MHBC has been given a lot and has a responsibility to give back and I'm, really proud to see that the tradition is, is carrying on. Uh, Gene, thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction and I really appreciate the uh, video documenting a little bit of the history of our company. Uh, first off, on behalf of the partners at MHBC, uh, this is a very uh, incredible honor. Uh, we are honored to be the first company to receive this award and we will, I will ensure that this, uh, that this award is displayed
proudly at our company. It's a constant reminder of the importance of the partnership that we have with the university and the connection that we have not only to the faculty, but also to the students. And as has been mentioned, it's been a 50 year journey and one that we've really enjoyed. Uh, for me personally, uh, it's really special to be recognized from the university where I went to school and got my training from. I'm a graduate in 1998. And it's just been a real, to come back 20 years later and still have that connection with the school, uh, being had that opportunity to work with students and have students that can continue to come through our program. It's just, it's, it's, I can't say how much of an honor this is to our company tonight. And I'd just like to thank the University of Waterloo uh, for this recognition. So thank you. Thanks for your, for your remarks, Brian. Um, we can maybe chat for a few minutes. You know, like I'm really inspired by the Black and Indigenous um, scholarships that you've created. And, um, you know, that's the MHBC award um, in this way is one of the, uh, was one of the first really um, for this. And I think, you know, the whole country is waking up to the need for more focus on on diversity, inclusion, anti-racism. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, from a plan, as a planning professional, you know, um, can, you, can you say a little bit more about, about why um, equity, diversity, inclusion is so important today? I think, thank you, Jean. I think it's the diversity, equity, inclusion, when you really look back to it, it's the foundation of Canada. It's the foundation of Ontario. It's our strength. Uh, we have so many different perspectives uh, different initiatives, immigration, and it's really formed the foundation of, of Canada and Ontario. And just being able, you don't have to turn on the news, uh, just turning on the news, you you quickly, uh, we've become very aware over the last couple of years of some of the injustices uh, that have happened to uh, different, uh, different communities within Canada and different immigration. And this was just a small area that we thought we could try to make a difference and any way that we can to help give an opportunity to um, an area of injustice or where we can provide some assistance uh, to help with that education. I was delighted to hear the uh, the first award's been uh, received and uh, it's just, it, it really just brings chills to you that it's it's just such an honor to see uh, this opportunity being presented to others. It's, uh, you know, my opportunity at the university has provided me and my family a great opportunity and anywhere that we can assist to provide others is just a, it's a true honor and something that we've really, really enjoyed with the university over the past 50 years and how we just want to continue as a company to partner, partner with the school uh, for these future opportunities. Well, well, thank you. And, and, and let me just tell you, it's, it's not just the individual students that you're affecting, like you're actually setting an example for the whole campus and for our whole alumni community. So um, that, that act, which might seem singular, is actually um, having an entire cascade effect, which is amazing. So here's a question I'm going to ask. You keep hiring University of Waterloo uh, <laughs> students and alums. So is there something special about them? Or, or you just 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 lo love the your, your allegiance to the school. I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, absolutely, there's that uh, special. It's uh, we we have uh, about 75 percent of our partners are University of Waterloo grads. Um, I can tell you from all of the co-op students that we've had um, join our company for various co-op terms, and and many co-op students have continued on with our company. But the students, they're they're fun, they're hardworking they're bright, they're innovative, and they're creative. And it's, it's a really, the co-op program I found has been a two-way street for us. It's, uh, we get to learn just as much from them as they get to learn from us. It's, you know, they come to uh, the education that they're getting at the University of Waterloo is teaching them different ways of innovative, uh, ways for sustainability and solutions. And they're leading edge in terms of the front edge in terms of science and research. So these are all things that, you know, getting these young bright students to come in and help shape and and help teach us too is just a, it's an incredible two-way street so we've really enjoyed uh, working with the students of the university and we've also had the opportunity to come in and do some guest lecture and so you know it's I love working with the faculty and stuff but our real true passion is uh, just being able to roll our sleeves back up with the students and and sharing some of these stories and ideas so it, it's 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 been a true honor and one that uh I can tell you we have our commitment. We will continue going forward in the future. And I just saw the, the job postings coming up for the new co-op terms and we're we're getting our, all our offices ready there, Jean's, Dean Jean. So uh, we, we really, yeah, it's beautiful. 
Uh, I love it, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for your commitment uh, to the institution and to our students. Um, we'll, we'll chat again with you at, at the end as we bring everybody back. And uh, again, just warm congratulations and thanks for, for all everything you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Our next recognition is for the Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award, and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce a fellow geographer who I have known for more than 30 years, having gotten to know her while she was doing her PhD with Dr. Bruce Mitchell at, at, at Waterloo. The awardee is Dr. Maureen Reed, a distinguished professor at the University of Saskatchewan who serves as an assistant director academic in the School of Environment and Sustainability, a school that she was instrumental in creating. A world-class researcher and prolific scholar, Maureen has made exceptional contributions to the understanding of many of the social dimensions of sustainability by addressing the critical and often overlooked interconnections amongst gender, politics, and environmental governance. Maureen was looking at intersectionality before most of the rest of us knew what the word meant. She's led path-breaking research on gender and forestry in the global north, distinguishing herself as a leading expert in this area. She was one of the first researchers to incorporate feminist theory and gender-based analysis into sustainability science. And her award-winning book, um, Taking Stands, has opened important conversations around women's activism in environmental and community protection, inspiring researchers around the world. Maureen is also a leading expert in multi-level governance for conservation, particularly in biosphere reserves. She holds the prestigious UNESCO Chair in Biocultural Diversity, Sustainability, Reconciliation, and Renewal. And she leads a research lab exploring models of governance and actions to help communities become resilient and make progress toward environmental and social sustainability. As one of the few social scientists conducting research with biosphere reserves, Maureen's leadership and contribution toward mobilizing knowledge has shaped the way that biosphere reserve practitioners worldwide work together, and it's amplified the impact that their work has. A prolific academic, Maureen has edited or written 12 books, authored or co-authored more than 150 peer-reviewed chapters in journal articles, and supervised more than 125 graduate students. Lucky them. Through her scholarship, partnerships, projects, and leadership, Maureen's work has broad reaching impact, supporting and informing policy, building a community of practice amongst practitioners, training the next gen of change agents, and most importantly, supporting the communities that are most affected by her findings. Please share your congratulations in the chat while we get to know Maureen a little bit better through the video. Both the value and the privilege of an education was instilled in me early on. My great grandmother stood on the corner selling eggs so that her daughter, my grandmother, could go to school. Family certainly instilled a sense of how privileged I am and how privileged we are in Canada and a sense of service that with that privilege, we have things that we need to provide to others. I focus on the social dimensions of sustainability and in short, what that means to me is really looking at people, processes, and institutions and see how these shape how we make decisions about environment and development. So I try to explain how gender and other social factors such as age, socioeconomic status, indigeneity, how these things come together to privilege some groups and frankly exclude other groups from the really important decisions about our environment, about sustainability, and increasingly about climate change adaptation. One of the things that I'm really pleased about is the way in which some of the work that I've done around gender and diversity is now being taken up in public policy. And what I've come to realize is that we share common interests that these kinds of issues need to be addressed by bringing the natural, the social, and the health sciences together. I'm gonna to pass on a piece of advice that my sister gave me before I started high school. And she said to me, Maureen, get involved, don't wait. So for those of us in environment and sustainability, 
there's no better advice. The planet needs you, people need you, and the rewards are enormous. So thank you so much. And uh, I realize it's my turn to say how much I appreciate this particular award. And given the, um, the work that I've done in forestry, it's so lovely to have a beautiful um, piece of carved wood that we'll be able, I'll be able to kind of remember this day and this honor that you've bestowed on me today. Um, it's also just truly amazing to be part of this group um, this particular cohort, but also the larger group of U of Waterloo alumni who are just doing amazing, amazing things. So thank you so much for um, the honor to be included amongst you. Um, it's also a little bit um, embarrassing, I think, to be singled out because I think as so many of the people have already said, we don't work alone. And so I'd like to say thank you to the nominees, thank you to my students and colleagues, and thank you to some amazing community research partners. Um, I also have been mentored through my early years in particular, and I'm gonna call out Bruce Mitchell, Olav Slaymaker, and Las Labkulich, who were very important in my formative years and continue to inspire me. I also want to say thank you to my family members, both my formative family, um, of whom you've seen some snapshots and heard some stories already, but also my family here in Saskatoon, my lifetime partner and husband, Bruce Wood, my children, Lewis and Michael, and various assorted four-legged members who come in and out of our our house every day. But of course, I also want to be grateful for the tremendous friendships for with those with whom I studied. So when I started my PhD, I thought it was critically important to have a great supervisor. And I was right. And I had a great supervisor. But what I really didn't appreciate at the time was the importance of community that would build, that I would be able to start to build at the university. And I want to thank the University of Waterloo and in particular the Faculty of Environment for creating a space for me to, to really flourish as part of a community, as part of a person and an emerging academic. And so I'm sort of hoping that in a very small way, I can replicate that for students, staff, and faculty at the University of Saskatchewan where I now work. So thank you so much for that sense of community and for the honor that you have bestowed today. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for, um, for being uh, such an, an amazing alum and, and for sharing yourself with us. Um, maybe a, a few questions. I, wa I wanna start with, um, uh, the talk that I remember you giving at the Canadian Association of Geographers in 2006, I think it was the Suzanne McKenzie Memorial Lecture. And I remember you were talking about the intersection of forestry and gender. And, and, um, and I'm, just, I'm just curious how, how you came to put those two pieces together. Yeah, well, I grew up in Vancouver where public debates in forestry have really been going on for as long as I can remember. And then in 1993, I was at UBC and what was then called the War in the Woods sparked the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. And Plaquette Sound, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island really became the site of what mainstream media at the time called an eco-feminist peace camp. And, and yet it was really far from peaceful at that time. And uh, women who in other times would have been quite valorized for literally standing up beside working class men were vilified for the role they took in trying to protect jobs and trying to protect so-called industrial forestry. 
And I thought there's got to be a better way, right? That we've got to learn more about them and learn how can we move beyond thinking between, you know, us and them all the time? And how can we start to think about sustainability from the perspectives of people who are not the same as us, who have different perspectives and different positions in relation to these debates? And so I really, I saw that, I guess, as an opportunity, but also a bit as a calling, I guess. Nice, nice. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about biosphere reserves. I mean, I guess the, the real question I want to know is about how do you make successful partnerships with such a diverse stakeholder group? But, but for the audience, I'm curious too, how many biosphere reserves in the world have you been to? Like, and um, maybe tell us just a little bit about that program. Um, well, I couldn't tell you how many I've been to. I haven't been to all of them in Canada. There are 19 in Canada and over 700 around the world in 130 one or two countries, I think. Um, and so um, what I would say is they do tremendous work and I'm always awed by the amount of work that they do. Um, a lot of them doing that as volunteers, particularly in Canada. And so in building partnerships with them and with others, I think there are about three things I would suggest. And one, the first one is to start to listen. You know, as academics, we often are the ones that start the talking or start the conversation. But um, as the saying goes, you know, we have two ears and one mouth and that we should start to use them in proportion. Um, so listening is a good strategy. But it also takes a lot of elbow grease. And I think other people have already referred to this that it's a lot of work. Um, it's work both for them as well as for uh, those of us in academia. And uh, my dad used to tease me about uh, becoming an academic so that I could uh, be off in my garret in Paris just writing big thoughts, right? And uh, that's just not true, right? Academics can't be hiding out in attics and pretending that they're doing anything. And we have to learn to get dirty to listen and then to put the work in. And I think the last thing is really to find joy in it. Um, what biosphere regions, people in biosphere regions are doing is so tremendous um, and they are working so hard. And so I think it's, we need to find ways to celebrate and to really love what we do together. It's, uh, it's wise words and uh, finding joy in what we do has been especially hard, I think in COVID for a lot of people, but. Uh, but it is the key to, to being sustained in the long run. So yeah, thank you for those wise words. So again, we'll have you back when the, when the group uh, gathers together. So congratulations again, Maureen. Okay. Our fifth award tonight is our second Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award. And it's, um, this is, is going to, um, to Derek Coleman. Mm -hmm. Um, who has been a purpose-driven trailblazer throughout his career. He was one of the first PhD students in planning at the university, studying under the late Dr. Bob Dorney, who himself was a pioneer as an ecologist in, the, in a school of planning. Now, based on his unique education, Dr. Coleman established one of the first environmental consulting firms in Ontario dedicated to environmental research and analysis. And of course, the importance of that has just grown and grown. Over the course of his impressive and prolific 50-year career, he has completed more than a thousand projects in seven provinces, and he has appeared as an expert witness before tribunals on more than 200 occasions. Derek's work was foundational to establishing programs and systems that protect thousands of hectares of significant lands in Southern Ontario. He was also a charter member of the first Ecological and Environmental Advisory Committee in the province, and he was deeply involved in related activities in Waterloo Region. Derek is also a philanthropist and a champion of his community. He established a charitable foundation through which he has developed and sponsored many creative initiatives supporting education, research, and environmental causes. A few examples. At the rare charitable reserve in Cambridge, he sponsors an annual scholarship and bursary program to support students in early career research projects. 
As a board member on the Canadian Institute of Planners Student Trust Fund, he initiated and continues to support travel awards for students, giving them the opportunity to attend the National Planning Conference. And a third example, he is a benefactor of the Cambridge Stewardship Initiative, through which he has sponsored more than 100 tree plantings and education programs for both elementary and high schools. Now, given his many contributions to the local region, you won't be surprised that he's been recognized by others. For example, he was recognized by the, um, for his contributions to the Cambridge and Grand River area by the Grand River Conservation Authority. Now, before, before we hear from Derek, well, let's watch a short video and learn a little bit more about his many contributions and then get to know him a little bit as he chats with us. Well, my career, which has been varied over time, there have been many, uh, many things that I've achieved that give me a great deal of satisfaction. Protecting thousand acres of environmentally significant features, getting major projects through approval process with public consultation. And for my early years, I always had a strong interest in the outdoors. My, my father was a real hunter and fisherman, and I grew up uh, uh, under his tutelage, uh, but my mother was also a very strong influence in my life. The major thing at, well, for my time at Waterloo is uh, that Len Gertler, the first director of the school, he and I were able to secure a major grant that allowed me to hire students and undertake uh, substantial development work for a computer data bank that uh, served, served well for a number of years as a teaching tool afterwards. My professional career, I established one of the first environmental ecological consulting firms in the province, and I've worked in that role for the last, uh, well, 50 years now. The community is, in Cambridge in this case, is our larger family, and the satisfaction I get from uh, seeing things develop here in the, in the right way, and I've assisted the planners in developing the policies for their planning documents and also providing funding for a variety of projects, particularly something called RARE, which is a major ecological reserve, uh, 400 acres in Cambridge, where I support four or five student research projects every year. And it's a great deal of satisfaction in seeing the young people come along and get their hands dirty in the field and have to report back to me on their successes. But over the years, I've I've, you know, networked broadly and developed partnerships that suited the circumstances at the time and moved from location to location or role to role. That, uh, I would say younger self, <laughs> maintain the flexibility and maintain your contacts and uh, things just will happen in the right way. I'd like to uh, really thank uh, thank the faculty and the university for for this uh, award. Um, being the last in the line here certainly has major advantages, and I'm both humbled by the extent of the uh, what the people before me have achieved. I'm I'm just in awe, and I, but I'm also encouraged that. Uh, the university and the faculty is continuing to produce such uh, strong candidates for awards uh, such as this. It's certainly I'm a, a, a impressed by the raw, broad range of activities and 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 locations. I, I'd like to to just you know we're on schedule and I'll just digress a little bit because I'm an old senile, senile guy. But if you see what this is. In 1969, when I, I came to the school, uh, to use a computer, you had to go up to the computer building at, in the northern end of the campus. And the computer was in what was the size of a swimming pool um, with filled with equipment. And God down there sat, sat at a little desk and ran the whole thing. And you punched in your information on cards that you fed into a reader. Um, we've progressed so far that that entire swimming pool now fits in a little 
capsule like like this that I can that I can plug in uh, and works much better and much easier and I don't have to go to the north end of the campus. Um, but when I arrived in, in 1969, the school was in a similar state. It, it was just progressing out of the uh, Department of Geography, uh, School of Planning, Urban Re uh, Regional and Resource Planning it was into its first year and just taking in the first graduate students. Uh, there were per perhaps 10 or 15 grad students in the program when I started out, and three of us in the PhD program. And now we're, we're at what? Uh, faculty with 3,000 students and 100 faculty members. It's just been a phenomenal similar growth. And also the quality of the, uh, the quality of the, the work that's being done, which depends so much as mine did on the faculty that were there. I was just blessed to be one of Bob Dorney's, well, I was Bob Dorney's first student as a PhD and Len Gertner, who was the first uh, director of the school, arranged for that major grant that just uh, got my career launched into ecological planning. And um, from the basis at the university, things just have developed. And I'm so grateful for the foundation that I, I received then. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. And I hope I haven't thrown you off schedule. <laughs> no, no. And in fact, being reminded about the uh, the swimming swimming pool sized computer room. I remember when I was a high school student in the early 70s, they came down to Waterloo and other universities to tour to decide where to study. I didn't choose Waterloo in part because I found that computer building so intimidating. And it's uh, it's funny looking looking back now, but, but, um, but you know, you were kind of like, you were a pioneer. You were getting into a field that was brand new. And I, I just wonder, I guess two things, how has that field of sort of environmental planning changed and and what has sort of sustained your interest for this for the duration of your career well certainly certainly the field has changed i mean when when i started planning in the province was rudimentary i mean we didn't have regional governments waterloo region came along and uh, you know we got a regional official plan and environmental policies have just uh, uh, developed to be very uh, comprehensive and required required nowadays, as have uh, environmental assessments, which were brand new, uh, you know, back then, and they have, uh, they have uh, uh, emerged as, as well. Uh, you know, I like, I, 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 I'll slip in another little story. <laughs> the reason I came to Waterloo was that um, I had an aunt in Guelph, who belonged to a garden club. And this professor came over and talked to uh, her garden club. And she so impressed the members of the garden club that uh, she said, I should go over and meet with this guy, Bob Dorney. And, and I did, and, and Len. And um, the time that faculty has taken to do things like that, go and talk to garden, garden clumps um, and to nurture students is, has created what has grown now into a fully developed burgeoning field, I think, is, as you called it, Gene. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's amazing often how those little serendipitous moments uh, sort of make a difference to people. And, yeah, and you know, speaking of that, you've been a real committed philanthropist, you know, and I wonder, there are lots of folks who, you know, you know, we write our check maybe at the holiday season in order to support a charity, but like you've rolled up your sleeves and gotten involved. I wonder, do you have any um, advice for would-be philanthropists or, or people who want to maybe lead ar around causes that they, that they hold in their heart? Well, sir, certainly, I, I should perhaps explain one of the f major reasons, and that is uh, my wife and I were not blessed with children. So um, our family is more, the, the community is more the focus of us and, and our, our family and the community that we live in is, is, is Cambridge. And so I've now for 20 odd years support, looked for and found and supported various 
activities and programs. And there are a number of things that I look for. And, and one, uh, I'm very much a hands-on guy. And I, I actually get out and plant trees with the grantees uh, or, grant, or grant recipients. Um, and I, I, I like specific activities that I can see results for and go, go, go back and visit. I mean, I'm very fortunate with the type of field that I'm in to be able to uh, do that um, rather than just handing off do dollars and you never hear anything again. Uh, you know, I, I want to hear back and I want to meet and see the, the people who are involved. And I, I also look for continuing projects that are a program over time and not a once, once a year and it's gone kind of event. So it's, it's created, created for us uh, just a, you know, a, a fantastic uh, side to our life as I move out of environmental consulting, which I'm, I'm doing now, and it will provide us with satisfaction for a much longer time. So the, uh, the fan philanthropy is actually a very self-serving, <laughs> a very self-serving side of our life because I, I enjoy it and I'll be continuing it for quite a period of time. And I encourage others to do what, uh, find their own niche and, uh, and do the same kind of thing. Well, I think that's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, I think it's humble of you to say it's self-serving because it really gives so much to others as well, which is amazing. You know, at this time, I, I want to invite back in all of our um, award recipients. And uh, this is a time where for those of you in the audience, you could maybe click on the Q and A button and you could uh, maybe direct a question to one or several of our, of our award winners. So we've got Brian and Maureen and Anne Marie. We're waiting for Eric to come in. There's Eric as well. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, good. So, um, so I, I've got a couple of questions, I guess, to, to, to start it off, but, but one of them, I guess I, wanna, I wanted to ask about courage. Um, you know, each of you is a pioneer in your own way. You, you've, you've tackled something that um, you maybe didn't know how to do. Um, you made it happen. Um, for some of you, you defined a new field. And I just, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, where, where did you find the courage to explore these things? Or when you, when you were lacking courage, um, sort of what, what uh, reinvigorated you to, to sort of con continue? So I don't know who would like to maybe start. I've got a few smiles uh, on the screen. So, okay, we've got Derek ready to start. Okay, go, go ahead, please. I, I Sure, I, I'll provide a comment. I mean, uh, I've actually reinvented my consulting career three times in my in my life moving from different organizations into different different situations and um you know sometimes things just don't work out and it's time to say <laughs> sayonara and move on and uh, take that chance and that risk and uh, and it it you know things turn out well uh, whatever <laughs> okay all right good um I'm just looking to see who's got their, like, who's most poised. Maureen, Maureen you leaned in, so I guess that makes you up next. <laughs> um, for me, it's probably family. You know, if you, you know that people will support you and care about you regardless, it kind of gives you a bit of inspiration to dip your toe in a different water. And, uh, you know, my, um, my husband, Bruce, once said, you know, you, you have one life you know, live it to the best you can and try it. And so I think that's, um, that's really good advice. I think it's very good advice. Um, Brian, what if, any, any comment on this one? I'd have to be very thankful to Ian McNaughton, the founder of our firm for courage. I think the one thing I remember from the day I started with the company was just him telling me, believe in yourself. And and I think that's a lot of what he did to found MHBC. And he's really instilled in me that importance to give back to community, give back to the school, because they're the, they're the foundation for our institutes, for our, our next generations and learning and stuff. So it's really, a, I'm very thankful for Ian for pushing me just to believe in myself and my career. And then from there, you got to take a little bit of accountability and responsibility yourself and, uh, and every day is not easy, but it's, um, it really is a rewarding and fulfilling career. 
You know, I want to say a special thank you to Ian too. I don't know, some of you may have known that on, on Giving Tuesday, um, we were launching a new scholarship um, and Ian put up um, the, 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 the money that would be the match in order to encourage donations. And so, you know, I'm just really grateful to, to, to Ian and, and many fronts, but that's sort of the latest example, which is really quite incredible. Um, what One of about, the knowledge integration you... mantras there is uh, that failure leads to success. And another Lindaism is about uh, good things coming to those who work at things. Um, and I, I took a lot from the knowledge integration approach of trying things out and trying diverse experiences and not taking one failure or setback as permanent, um, but as a, a learning experience and an opportunity to pivot and try something new. Uh, I think there's often a lot of pressure on people to get things right the first time and to figure out what your career will be from day one of, of first year university. Um, but I have changed and pivoted a lot. Uh, and uh, I think that that is a, a productive path forward. Nice, nice. And Anne-Marie? Um, I think for me, I sort of go with the idea that to, you know, try to do things that scare you. Um, because if you do things that are simple and that you know how to do, you're never going to grow or learn. So, you know, even if it's something like public speaking or, you know, or, or going up and networking and meeting somebody new, you know, like it, it is a scary thing and, uh, but you just never know where it's going to get you. So I try to do as much of that as I can. You know, you're a, you're a girl after my own heart. You know, um, this is a personal story, but a number of years ago, about 12 years ago, my dad died and my dad was one of the most likable people you'd ever met, ever meet. But he, he never really um, left the small village that I grew up in and, and, um, and he always had a reticence. And when he died, I promised myself I would try something new every month that I didn't want to do. So I won't show you the book where I wrote them down, but, but you are a woman after, after my own heart. I think trying to do those things that scare you you know, so long as they're not too stupid, is actually a good way, a good way to live. All right, here's a question you don't know is coming because um, uh, this is a fun one for me to ask, but, but what do you think the faculty or the University of Waterloo or just universities in general should do better or differently? Here's some advice you can you can give. Sorry, right, you can you can start, Anne Marie, since you're you're still on my screen. Um, what can they do differently? Um, I think that I've seen I've seen our university, our faculty change over the years, especially. Um, but I think it's it's very much it's the it's it's the one on one connections. It's the being you know. I think that we are very lucky in our faculty, but um, you know, making those connections with the students right from the beginning, being open, being available. Um, and I think that you know, again, it, it's hard to it's hard to fault our faculty. I think in any way because you know, I, I was I was in your I think second year of teaching statistics class. Um, and uh, and still to this day, I think that you know any of us will remember that class and just remember how accessible you were and things like that. And I think that that's the one of the most important things is that it can't just be about you know professors that are up here and, and, and students that are down here. It needs to be that, that that connection. And I think that's why the university and the faculty have stayed with me because of those connections I was able to make. But I do think that that's super important um, for students. Thank you. That's a, it's an important, important message, especially these times. Anybody else dare to tell us what we're not doing well enough that we should step up a little more? Eric, you're smiling. Go ahead. And then, <laughs> I, and then Brian after that. Okay, Brian, yeah. okay, you're on my screen. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you want me to it's, go first? Please? Oh, go for it, Brian. Okay. Um, Gene, I'd like to just say, I think the most important thing I would say from the schooling per, uh, perspective is to from the university is taking theory to practice. And I really wanna compliment the university on this because I know there's been a real initiative with the faculty of uh, bringing in more practitioners, uh, bringing in more real life examples, working through case studies, um, you know, and I think that's very important for the students to roll up their sleeves and actually work on real live projects that are going on in the communities now because it gives you that that firsthand experience of the policies, the documents, the challenges that we face in our profession. So I want to applaud the school because I've, I've seen a big 
tremendous improvement there. And I just encourage uh, the faculty to continue in that vein because I think it's the most valuable experience that students can have uh, coming out to start their careers. So um, congrats to the university for uh, starting to really being a leader in this area. And uh, it's one of the things that I wish I had a little, I'll be honest, I wish I had a little bit more during my tenure at the school, but I've, I've known that it just tremendous improvements and the students really enjoy it, so. Sage advice, thank you. And of course, a lot of our alumni are, are the people who are allowing us to, to bring that back in, which is great. Okay, Eric, you're up next. It, it's dangerous to ask a millennial professor what they I know. want the university to do I know, I, I, I thought of that. <laughs> so, so let me creatively dodge the question here, which is okay. to just reflect for a second on the ways that universities are different as institutions. Right, we we live in this privileged space and this privileged opportunity where we get to work with and mentor students and and create knowledge that can help shape real world problems. And I, I think Waterloo and environment are there and pushing the right way. But I think we can also do things differently than the currents of society. And I I think it, two things in the contemporary moment. One is to fight for the value of in-person relationships. I mean, I'm, I'm a professor of emergency management, right? I do not underestimate for a moment COVID and its disastrous impacts. Um, but there is value in in-person relationships when we can build those in safe ways. And I think uh, universities holding true to that will be really important. Playing with cadence is another. The world demands productivity and results and speed and efficiency. And I think a lot of the educational journey is about slowing things down and taking time and reflecting. Um, and so I, I would challenge us to think differently than the currents and the pressures of the sort of neoliberal uh, capitalistic kinds of models in society and challenge us to, to hold that space where we create a different place for people to grow and change. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, maybe Derek, yeah. Let me just get unmuted here for a second. <laughs> I will be even more creative. And Frank, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. Oh. <laughs> and, well, and you're the I'm only not, one who thinks I'm that. I'm not going to drag it out to try and tell you something that I don't know anything about. So <laughs> keep it up. As far as right, I can see, you. you're doing a good job. Thank you. Marie, do you have anything to add? Um, well, it's just a general comment, not specific to Waterloo. but um kind of underscoring what's already been said i think really listening and connecting to the outside world um and building connection in a sense over critique or maybe to inform critique and to inform those kinds of reflections i agree with eric and others who have talked about connecting but also about the kind of privileged space we have to reflect but I also think that we need to ground that in our connections with others, you know, understanding what are the um, needs, knowledges, and um, interests of people who don't share the same privileges that we have. An important message. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, I'm not sure if other, I just want to remind folks that if you want to put a question in the question and answer or in the, uh, in the chat, that's, uh, I am, I am monitoring. Um, let me sort of, you know, we've talked a little bit about COVID and we've sort of danced around it, but here we are virtually, you know, for two years in a row, you know, um, giving each other virtual hugs and stuff. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, a reflection it can be a reflection on how you think society has changed and won't come back and maybe on a personal front um what you're most looking forward to once this covid scare and 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 you know tragedy is behind us so you know either 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 or maureen since you're on screen now why don't you just stay and, and you got anything to share there well i'd love to get beyond the virtual hug <laughs> but really making those connections that's all fair enough anybody else on the post-covid world what's going to change you think in the in the world that's not that's not going to snap back people keep talking about a new normal and i'm just wondering 
you know, it could be a new normal in your own personal life, but, but people are talking about it in terms of big societal trends. I don't know if any of you have, have thoughts. I think about this quite a lot and, you know, I don't have a crystal ball or at least if I do, it's more like a snow globe. It looks a little fuzzy, but um, anybody comment about the future? Well, I don't have a comment about the future, but I'll comment about what the experience of COVID has been. I yeah. think that one of the, and I've said this since the beginning, one of the greatest things that has come out of COVID, I think, is the sense of community. I know for myself, as a single person who works for herself, you know, who's like constantly, you know, by herself, um, it was it was very challenging, especially when I couldn't connect with like physically connect with my family. So my community changed tremendously because for me, I'm very lucky. I live near the lake in Toronto. So, you know, the only way to get out was to go out for walks every day. And it was those people who I didn't know who I've connected with like fairly deeply now. And the fact that, you know, we've for two years now, we've been like the closest people, the long, longest conversations, the, you know, the, the sharing of recipes, the sharing of comments, uh, the sharing of experiences, um, or just like taking in a sunrise together. Um, it's, I think that that's what's really changed for me. My community is so interesting. It's the the, the guys I see hanging outside the Tim Hortons, which I, you know, have no idea what their names are, but I say good morning to them every day. You know, I've changed, my community has changed tremendously just from this. You know, not that it's like something I wanted to happen because, you know, COVID just made it happen. But luckily, like I've got this whole new community that I wouldn't have had, you know, if I was just going to work and getting on the subway every day. Yeah, and I Marie, I wonder if, if we've ahead. ever walked past each other on those COVID era waterfront walks in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> but yeah what I... the saving grace is like just being able to connect with people that way even if it's just a good morning or a hello or oh it's cold out oh it's warm out oh it's too rainy out you know just that typical Canadian conversation yeah we love the weather Eric did you want to add a little bit a little bit more yeah, I mean, one of the joys of, of moving from studenthood to professorhood is having a chance to collaborate. So, um, I mean, Dr. John McLevy and myself and some others have a book coming out soon about the importance of face-to-face -face connections in producing reliable knowledge. And so I think that's going to be huge is the, the role of in-person connections and trust building. Um, but if I can also just sort of... Uh, pick up on, on something I hinted at briefly earlier. Um, I think we've, we've seen an era of real loss of faith in institutions and experts. Um, and I think that figuring out how we navigate that going forward is going to be really critical as well. Um, what is the role for institutions in society and how do we build uh, capacity for nonpartisan service and make sure that we protect those kinds of, of public service institutions because we will depend on their response again. Um, and a lot of, of really scary things have happened to sort of collective trust in these, these critical institutions. Okay, yeah, you're right. Thank, yeah, thank you for that. And Anybody? Gene, was, yeah, I was just going to comment on, uh, just echoing on what uh, are other award recipients have said is really looking forward to the collaboration coming back. Um, one thing when you're running a company and you're trying to hire new students and stuff, the, the best thing we can do, is we've had to reinvent ourselves in terms of how we onboard, how we mentor, how we make sure that a new student coming in to start their career is not feeling isolated and alone in an office and, and unsure. So it's, we've had to, and I really miss the people connection and sitting in a boardroom rolling up our sleeves, putting a plan on the table. And, you know, we've, I've always learned through my career that more thoughts create a better product and just getting back to that collaboration would just, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to putting those virtual hugs aside and uh, getting back to seeing people for sure. Yeah. I think a lot of us are, in fact, yesterday, the university of Waterloo had a board of governors meeting and the deans were invited for the day. And it was the first in-person meeting of any size I'd had in two years. So there were 40 of us there and there was some distancing, but the energy in the room was just beautiful. And I came home, it was the first time I felt like it was a normal day um, in the last in the last two years. So um, any other any other thoughts on on this on this post COVID uh, world? No, maybe not. Okay. I well, just like, I just like that you're referring to post COVID. So I like yeah. the optimism. <laughs> Please, oh please, yes. 
But well, our time is our time is almost up, and so I just want to you know I just want to say really sincerely congratulations to all of you. You make us so proud. The work you do is so incredible. Thank you for for all of that, and thank you for being with us tonight and inspiring those who are along. And of course, others will be watching um, the video as well in time, and so the inspiration will continue. Um, you know, stay in touch. Um, thank you for for the involvement to date, and we're sure there'll be more involvement in the in the future. And I. I wish you all the best for the holiday season and um, and for the post-COVID world that we're all going to enter together.